Marlis Potma is going to be leading that class. And lastly, on Friday, um, Alexis and Vicki and the staff, we sat around together and we talked about the women's conference. And let me tell you, they've got some amazing things planned for that day. So if you have not, ladies, registered for the women's conference, I would encourage you to do so. There is registrations in your seat backs. You can put them in the offering buckets as they pass by, or you can take one and give them to someone who you would love to invite to that event. So before we get started in our second Peter series again, let's go ahead and stand and meet and greet each other in the name of the Lord. Well, good morning, Newton Church of the Way. We are so glad you're here this morning. Will you join us as we worship our Lord Jesus? Your king. 
kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus from age to age. You reign. Your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Oh. I search the world. But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you Yes, I know it's true And I Afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you You turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn mourning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you're the only one who can you're the only one who can oh there's nothing Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is 
is better than you. Sing it to him. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Turn graves into gardens. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You pray with us. Lord, you shame, like the song just said, you turn shame into glory. Sometimes all, all we have to give is, is shame and just an acknowledgement of who we are and who, who you are. Lord, we just offer you know, our small, small coins that we can provide that you turn into much, much more. Lord, let it bless. Bless our community, bless this world. In your name we pray, amen. falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants. I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. 
what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory God, as we sing songs like this and we read your word, we're all too aware that there is a battle raging among us. And in some ways, it rages within, within your churches. It rages within your community of believers. And Lord, you are diligent about warning us, but are we equally diligent about heeding the warnings? We thank you for Peter's letter. We thank you for the ways that, that you inspire us as you inspired Peter to write down your words. So Lord, help us not just to be hearers of your word, but help us to be doers and help us to be the true teachers of your truth. So Lord, bless our time here this morning. Use your word with power to strengthen us and protect us. Help us, Lord, to be the people you've called us to be. We pray this in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So I want to take you back. Hello, everybody. I want to take you back to years ago when I began my training process in ministry. And um, I come from an ecumenical background where there's a lot. There's a lot of information that you go through. It's not like you just raise your hand and say, you know what, I want to be a preacher, I want to be a, a pastor, and they kind of say, oh, okay, uh, here, here's, here's what you do. It, it's not like that at all. It's actually this long process which, which you have to go through. You learn a lot, and you go through a lot. Um, one of which, one of the things that I went through is what, what's called an MMPI2 test. I don't know if you've ever taken that, but it's a psychological evaluation. And they take a look at you, but there's all these things that you go through. You get tested by other pastors, uh, members uh, in your own denomination. You go through this whole thing. And what is the point of all that? The point of it is, is that in the Christian church throughout history, there have been false teachers. And here's the deal about false teachers. Nobody wakes up, looks in a mirror and says, <laughs> I'm a false teacher. <laughs> Nobody does that. 
most false teachers don't know they're false teachers. They think what they're doing is what they're supposed to be doing. But there's a key to how you become a false teacher. And, and I mean, it's very simple to spot. And one of the things, you know, we, we've made it pretty clear that here at The Way, we're all about leadership development. Well, part of what we're about is vetting out false teachers. And there are, you know, just like in the game, po- I, I don't play poker, but I'm told that there are tells. See, this is why I don't play poker, because I'm so transparent. If I get a good hand, everybody's going to be like, fold. I, I just can't do that. I'm extremely, I'm what you see is what you get. That's just kind of how I am. But, but there are tells, and there are, there are red flags. There are warnings that indicate, not necessarily that you're a false teacher, but that you have false teacher potential. And can I, can I just tell you this? vent just a little bit they have been rampant over the last couple years and one of the things that you know for anybody that thinks they want it they want to lead a ministry the one of the reasons why it's so difficult is because it is a career of conflict i mean it just is you are constantly battling people um, and, and situations where, where people are going down this path. And, and you know, I'm, it's not always about heresy. So the element, one of the elements of a false teacher is it's somebody that wants to draw a crowd and have influence over a group of people, and they're driven by a personal desire. I mean, that's one of the key elements to being a false teacher, is that you're not really in it for others, you're in it for you. And you know, if you go, and you've heard me talk about this before, if you're new here, um, this can be your first time, but you'll hear me say it a lot. If your motivating factor in anything is purely you, you're going to get sidetracked, and you're going to get derailed. And I see people doing it all, 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 all the time, all the time. And so, it's not a coincidence that every apostle in Scripture warns of false teachers, every single one. And, and we sit there, we go through, and, you know, we kind of have, so we have friends, so we kind of determine whether or not something is good or bad is kind of how we feel about the person. Uh-uh. No. Do you know the number of times that I have been at odds with a friend who is, who is teaching something that's not biblical? And, and they're still friends. But when, when you're talking about situations and you're talking about false teachers, there's always the word that you have to throw in there that goes with it. And that's the word influence. Who are you granting influence to? And if God is giving you authority, or if you feel like you have authority or you have influence, how are you using it? And if you want to know if something is good or bad, look at how Christians have done it for the last 2,000 years. You know, one of the greatest indicators of a false teacher is somebody...
God told them to do. Now, by contrast, in chapter 2, we have the false prophets. And he says, he starts with the ver- verse 1. He says, there are also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. So as you kind of try to unpack this, and you go back to this idea that most false teachers don't know that they're false teachers, there's an element of theological truth that has to be present. And that is, is that you can't understand the truth without being truly born again. And a lot of people in churches are not born again. Let me say that again. You can't truly know the truth about God unless you are born again. And most people in churches, and I mean not most, but a lot, are not born again. One of the challenges that we have in America is that we are in a post-Christian society. You've heard me talk about this a million times, post-Christendom. What does that mean? It means that maybe not you, but people you know, or maybe people in your family, uh, 50 years ago, everybody just went to church. And they have a knowledge of the Bible. And they have kind of a rudimentary understanding of who Jesus is, what it means, and all these things that are present. But have they ever surrendered their life to it? Have they ever gone into a place where they are bearing spiritual fruit? Which, that's another, here's here's these great indicators. Are what they doing, are they doing it for themselves? Are they bearing good spiritual fruit? That's a huge one. And, 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 and you look at that, you look at that by looking at the fruit of their lives. And, you know, oftentimes when it comes to leaders, you know, we kind of hold this as a virtue to not be judgmental. And sometimes we're judgmental of leaders in the wrong way, in that we're critical. But what I would urge you to do is be judgmental of leaders by looking at the fruit they produce. I mean, I, I've, I've urged you to do that Uh, time and time again. Don't judge me as a leader by what I say. Judge me as a leader by looking at the people around me that I lead. And that's the only way to indicate whether or not some, because there's rumors, there's all kinds of lies. It's amazing to me. You just sit there and you hear things and you're like, seriously? People just buy BS, bad stuff. Wanted to stop you there before you went somewhere you shouldn't have. But you have to understand that they are among us. And, and this, you know, as you read this and you kind of work your way through it, you start getting all paranoid. But, but here's the way to approach this. Are you a false teacher? Are you? I mean, I I go through this, and I'm just like, oh, you know, am am, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Am I constantly? And and do you have people in your lives that are holding you accountable? Are you you in this place where people can be evaluating you? How transparent is your life? Are you trying to hide stuff? Because that's the first thing, right? What if somebody, what if somebody were to look into your life with greater detail? How do you feel about that? What if somebody were to look into your finances? Not that that's, the only reason why I bring up finances is because that's where oftentimes, I've always heard the story, you want to know what you worship. Look at your finances. And so there, there's all of these things in place. And this is kind of this picture. So there are false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. Somebody said one of the biggest differences between a true teacher and a false teacher is their dictionary. It's not their words, it's their meaning of words. And so, for example, if I use the word God, what does that mean? What does God mean? And we do. We use the word God. And, you know, it's not inappropriate to do so. But if I use the word God and and somebody else from a different religion used the word God, we're talking about completely two different things. How about the word Jesus? 
So if somebody walks into your room and they use the word Jesus, are they talking about the biblical Jesus? Do you know there are religions out there, well-known religions? They talk about Jesus and they claim to be Christian. And when you look under the hood, their Jesus is nothing like my Jesus. And so you've got to be smart. You, you can't just know about Jesus. You need to know Jesus. They, they, they will teach cleverly destructive heresies and deny the master who bought them. Um, in this way, they'll bring suddenly, sudden destruction on themselves. This is what's at stake. And this is why it's so important. I want to take you to, to, uh, to the book of James. If you've got your Bibles, turn to James chapter 3. And here's what it says. In this course, you know, when you're going through training to become a pastor or a, 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 well, a religious leader, at some point you're going to get to this text. And what it says is, James writes, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Yahoo. Right? I see people making decisions and leading other people astray, and I wonder if they even have a clue how big a deal that is. I see people telling half truths. See, that's the other thing, too, is a lot of, a lot of Christians, they don't, they don't tell bold faced lies. What they do is they kind of spin the truth just a little bit. I mean, a lot like Satan. And they'll spin it just a little bit, and then ultimately what they want over you is influence. And they want you to say, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And they want, they want this thing, but, but bear in mind, those who do that, you're accountable to God. If you are leading people in the kingdom of God, you're, you're accountable to God for those people. And it says... For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could always control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. Stop right there. Some of you, some of you are new here. And... I don't know, maybe you're evaluating how I preach. And maybe when we had other people preaching, you're evaluating how they preach. And, you know, they always say that when a person steps into a spot where they're speaking, there's an evaluation. And the, the first thing that people think about is, do I even like this person? Right? And one of the things they tell you in ministry is no matter what, at least 10% of the people aren't going to like you at all. Doesn't matter what you do. And that goes for everybody. So you're out there, there will always be, you can, you can hit a grand slam and 10% of the people that are listening, they'll be like, meh. And that, that's just the reality of it. And so you have to know all these things going into it. Um, and so one of the things that makes a difference, especially when it comes to religious teaching, is that you don't play to be liked. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be offensive and you need to be annoying or, or any of those things. You want to be the best version of yourself you can possibly be. But speech is cheap. Talk is cheap. And you know what? People that are swayed by foolish talk are fools. Are you swayed by foolish talk? Or do you, are, you, are you smart enough? Do you know the scripture? Do you know what the word of God says? And are you looking for the tells? And it's important you understand that. He goes on to say, A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it's set on fire by hell itself. The tongue. Talk, persuasive speech. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. 
Does a spring of water bubble out of a, both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. He's talking about fruit. He's talking about fruit. You don't judge a person in an instant. See, that's the other thing. Everybody in this room at some point in your life is going to have a low moment. And you're going to do something that you know is ultimately wrong. You, you just, maybe you're going to say something that you know you shouldn't have said. Maybe you're going to be involved in something that you know you shouldn't have done. The question is, is what do you do over a season of time? That's what determines. Just like this, at the same time, some of us can hold it together for a little while. Some of us can hold it together for an hour. But again, fruit is determined over time. And this is, this is the idea. I remember one time, it's kind of the same principle. I remember one time I had, a, had an employee that would come in late about every, you know, every other week. Um, you know, three or four times a month. And they came to me and they said, and I, you know, I said to them, I said, you're late again. And they're like, well, you know, just so you know, I'm, I'm on time more than I'm late. And I looked at them, I said, just so you know, you're supposed to be on time every day. It's not like you get an award for being on time. But this is this weird way of thinking that we have. It's like, yeah, I was on time. That means I'll come in a little bit late tomorrow. It's not how it works. You see, when you do the right thing over time, it bears the right fruit. When you do the wrong thing over time, it bears the wrong fruit. And this is this, is this great indicator. So if somebody, if somebody is a false teacher, they might do something right today, but how does it hold up over time? You know, one of the reasons why I've always said don't make any life-altering decisions in January, February, March is because people get, they get basically sucked into a, a, a bad situation and they're not being strategic in their thinking. They're being impulsive and they're reacting and you have to, you have to kind of, you have to kind of look at things. You have to, you have to look at things. And, and you know, for example, I'll give you the perfect example. You've got a boss who suddenly has turned into a jerk. You know, and maybe you're like, "Well, my boss is okay." We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Well, how do you know what's going on in that guy's life or gal's life? Maybe it's just a season. Maybe they're having a hard season. Do you take the time to talk to him and ask him? Or do you just, they're a jerk. See, that's an impulsive reaction. And so you have to, you have to understand that, that, that so many t things, and if you're trying to discern truth, that truth is oftentimes cumulative over time. And that's part of the whole thing. If you talk to, if you talk to like, leaders. They talk about the different areas of influence that you have in people's lives. Certain areas of influence are only possible if you have been involved for t over time. And that's, that's kind of this reality. So we go back to our Peter text, our second Peter text. He says, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. This is a big deal. Uh, many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. Have you ever seen those TV preachers that are like, if you give me $1,000, God will give you $10,000? Have you ever heard that? That's kind of this, this, this if, you ever, if you ever hear that, don't believe it, okay? Don't believe it. At the same time, we are called to be generous, and we are called to give to the church. And so there, there's kind of this weird dichotomy that exists. The, the dichotomy is, is that if all of y'all stop giving to the church, you're going to come in here one day and we won't have lights, Right? 
So there's kind of that balance, but then there's, there's like this, this piece where, where people are personally profiting uh, from a financial standpoint. Now, I will also tell you that one of the marks of a false teacher is they're greedy. They are not generous. They may tell you to be generous, but they themselves are not. So when you, when you, when you talk, so even, even myself, when I stand up here and I talk about um, giving, biblical giving, if I'm standing up here and I myself do not tithe, then I'm a false teacher. I'm a false teacher. And so when you talk about biblical things, and so you, you kind of you go in here and you, you get to this place where you just have to be very, very careful. And there's certain things that are easy to do from an a obedience standpoint. They're easy. Tithing is one of them. And so you, you get to this place. But if you start to make it all about money, and if money is what you're after, and you are trying, then you're just greedy. And he says, this is a great indicator. There's actually, a, it's kind of interesting, there's, a, there's an ancient book. It came out in either first or second century, early second century or late first century. It's called the Didache, if you've ever heard of the Didache. But anyway, in so many places, it kind of, it, it was right, the writing of the apostles of the early church. And they talk about false prophets. And one of the things they say about a false prophet is that there's two things that have to do with money. One is, if, if they're a traveling missional prophet and they stay more than three days, they're a false prophet. Which is kind of funny. Right? If they stay more than three days, they're a false prophet and a freeloader. Right? And the other one is, is if somebody goes into a trance and tells you that God told them you're to give them money, that's a false prophet. And so... We have these pictures of, he uses the word greed. They make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago and their, struck, their destruction will not be delayed. Sometimes we get taken advantage of. Sometimes we do. But you know what? It's better to be the one who's taken advantage of than the one who's taking advantage. They will not get away with it. And sometimes that's all you have. All you have is you have this comfort in knowing that all swindlers and all liars will not get away with it. A lot of the kind of the interesting, there's these series on Netflix where there's all these con men that, you know, and, I, and that they're, they're like convincing people that they're something that they're not, and then they're swindling money out of them. And a lot of them, it's like dating sites, right? You heard the t Tinder swindler? Anybody seen that? <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, it kind of stems from this idea. It's like Ponzi schemes or it's like, uh, um, you know, uh, catfishing, all of these things, but people buy into it. You know, my wife works at a bank, and unfortunately, there's all these people occasionally that are being taken advantage of. And it's very unfortunate. It's deception. It's lying. I don't know if you've ever had anybody that's been affected by a, a catfish scheme. They all have the same thing in common. They're telling the person what they want to hear. And they're saying it in a way, ooh, you know, it's really powerful when you say, ooh, you take somebody who's lonely and you say, ooh, oh man, I just love you. I can't wait till I see you. And I can be with you. And I, you know, and they, they, just, they just tell them all these things their itching ears want to hear, but they're just after their money. And so this is something to be careful. So um, Chuck Swindoll has a list and I want to read this for you real quick, but he talks about the contrast between a true teacher and a false teacher. And as we start to unpack this idea of how do you tell the difference? So in a true teacher, number one, words are faithful, and they're also firsthand accounts of how the word of God has changed people's lives. That, that's true. False is words are cleverly devised myths. And they're not, there are not firsthand accounts. Second bullet point, words, uh, true people, you must heed their words because they're trustworthy. Uh, second bullet point, false teachers, you must reject their words because they're deceptive and they're dangerous. 
True uh, teachers, words are light to shine in darkness. Um, false teacher, words are darkness to be driven out. They create darkness. Again, you're getting into the fruit. Is the fruit confusion? Is it division? Is the fruit isolation? That's not godly fruit. Is it jealousy? Is it outbursts of anger? Is it immorality? All of these things. This is how, so, so darkness to be driven out. Light to shine in darkness. They, they, it transforms, one transforms light into, into darkness. The good one transforms darkness. It, it, it drives out the darkness with light. Finally, um, words are inspired by the Holy Spirit and a true teacher and a false teacher. Words are inspired by human desires or evil spirits. Now what's interesting is, is that false teachers are, are, are referred to in scripture as they serve Satan. But again, it's not like they know that they're serving Satan. They're just being used because the ultimate swindler is Satan. And all he has to do is use their own selfish desires all he has to do is appeal to their itching ears. That's all he has to do. And people fall for it because they're not, they're not grounded in Scripture, they're not in prayer, and they're not seeking a relationship with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. They are just kind of at the mercy. They just kind of fit Christianity in whenever they have time. I haven't been to church for a while. You know, maybe it's time we go. What does the Bible say? Well, I don't know. Judge not lest ye be judged. Right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Everybody knows that. How about I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? You know the coffee cup verses, but do you know what the Bible says? And this is a dangerous position to be in if you don't know, if you're not getting equipped, if you're not shoring up and living in truth. There, it's not a matter of there could be false teachers. There are. There are. Are you ready for it? Ready to stand up to it? Do, do you have your support system in place? Do you have all of these things in place? Do, do, you, do you have the word of God as your foundation? Have you built your life on the truth? Or are you just going through? I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Here, here's, here's how deceptive it can be. And th you're going to sit there, and when I read this to you, you're going to be like, oh, this is crazy. This is how hard it is to discern truth in Scripture. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Exodus 34, starting with verse 6. Okay? This is the challenge of being a true teacher in, in, in the kingdom of God in the church. So we go, um, starting with verse 6, the Lord passed in front of Moses, and th these are the words of God. Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Continuing that thought, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of parents upon their children and grandchildren, the entire family is affected, and even children in the third and fourth generations. What's the truth? It all is. But see, here's what a false teacher does. They take part of that. So here's what I'm gonna do as a false teacher. I'm gonna omit the last, the second half of that, and I'm gonna go, you know what? The Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness, he lavishes unfailing love to a thousand generations, and I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Stop right there. That's all I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the other part. Because the other part doesn't make me feel good. Right? This is what people do. And folks, I would be a false teacher if I didn't preach the whole word of God. And if somebody you know is telling you things and they're not teaching you the full word of God, they're a false teacher. Maybe they don't know it. It's not like you can say, you know what, I think you're a false teacher. It doesn't work because they'll be like, I'm not a false, what are you talking about? They don't know. You don't know what you don't know.
Let me go back to my earlier statement. If you're not born again, you can't know the truth. If you, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, if you haven't received the new heart from Christ, if you haven't received the Holy Spirit, which has the power to change the way we think, you don't know what you don't know. And so you have to be careful. Now again, I, you know, I could also be a false teacher if I focus on the second half. Some false teachers, you know, they, they say that some false teachers, they broaden the road to heaven and they make it accessible to everybody without pointing them through Jesus. Other false teachers, they make it really narrow and only people named Steve Harima can enter. Right? And you see kind of both both extremes. Only people of a certain political party can enter. Right? Only people of a certain ideology can enter. Because it's not about what Jesus is doing, it's about what a politician is doing. That's a false teacher. And all of these things should be red flags, and they raise red flags in the way that we live. So, Again, Chuck Swindoll says there's four things that, that, a, that a false teacher does. Number one, they present heresy, which is, al- is, which is an alternative to the truth, a misleading truth, maybe a half-truth. They present heresy. Number two is they ultimately deny truth. They omit parts of Scripture. Number three, they model sensuality. What does that mean? Flesh-driven desires, whether it be greed whether it be sexual immorality, whether it be just attention, seeking. And number four is that, is that they, 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 are, they represent covetousness, which means that they always want something other than what they have. That's another piece to all of this. You have to beware... Um, and so there's so many, there's, again, there's so many deceptive ways in which to go through this. So uh, kind of three things. How do we protect ourselves about such things? You stop, you look, and you listen. Stop, look, and listen. Stop speaks to the timeline, right? So don't allow yourself to be impulsive. Don't allow yourself to be impulsive. The number of people that totally impulsively put themselves in a completely different position over the last two years is mind-boggling. And the reason why they did it, it wasn't necessarily because that's what they were supposed to do. They did it because they were just stressed out, discouraged. And they thought, well, I need to leave whatever situation I'm in, no matter whether or not it's been good for 10 years. Doesn't matter. They call it the great reset, right? I mean, this is, this is kind of this picture call it the great resignation too. I've heard that, that time, the great resignation. Everybody wants to quit whatever situation they were in over the last two years. And so you have to stop. So, um, don't just buy into anyone or anything. You need, to be, you need to be cautious. You need to understand. Don't rush into something. Uh, when you're granting influence, be careful who you grant influence to. Be very, very careful. In some ways, it's okay to make them earn it. And, and let me tell you, I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll go back. I said this earlier. Just because they're your friend doesn't mean they aren't a false teacher. I mean, it's amazing the number of people that buy in to the bad stuff, bad stuff, from friends. It's actually something I learned from my dad. My dad was one of those people that I I observed him um, holding on to the truth and the right thing to do, even in the face of his friends not being in that same place. And I even asked him, I said, how do you do that? How do you you hold a friend accountable when they're doing something they shouldn't do? And I remember he always told me, he says, you know, if they're truly your friends, you owe them the truth. Now, they may not receive it in the moment, but ultimately, they'll go down in their lives and they'll realize that you love them enough to tell them the truth at some point. And that's part of it, so stop. Um, 
I want to contrast these points with words of Jesus. If you got your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew, specifically the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in chapter 7. We'll be working our way through there. So in Matthew uh, chapter 7, we're going to start with verse 21 to 27. Um, and, and Jesus talks a lot about false teachers. He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many, many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Many people. So when it comes time to uh, being discerning and being shrewd and intelligent, do not be impulsive. And can I tell you that a couple months is no time. It's no time at all. How how fast have the last two years gone? Depends, When when we're on the front side of it looking forward, it's like, oh man. Time is just dragging on. But now you look back, you're like, man, that that was really no time at all. So you stop. Now the second, you stop. I told you the second one is look. You look around you. You look into the life of the person who's who's the leader or who has influence over your life. Look into their life. Are they in a position? Have they put themselves in a position where they're accountable? Do they have people whose job it is to, o- to look over them from a spiritual standpoint? Or are they just kind of out doing whatever they want to do? You know, a lot of people, big movement now that's going out there are house churches. I have no issue with house churches. It's the way things first began. I have an issue with people leading a church or any type of movement with no accountability. I have an issue with that. I would be very, very cautious. I've had people actually say to me, you know who I'm accountable to? Jesus. You know what? That's good. But Jesus manifests himself through others. And, And one of the ways, so the reason why we need each other is because we should be accountable to each other. Are they accountable? Are they just out doing whatever they want? Um, are they transparent? Do they have a culture of transparency? If you were to come up to them and you were to ask them a personal question, would they answer it? I mean, obviously there's certain things that it just don't fall under, you know, decorum. I mean, I, there's certain things I'm not going to talk with you about that, are, that have to do, I'm not going to go into detail. <laughs> But if you want, to, you want to know what I make and what I give and you want to know what, uh, what my thoughts are about any given situation, you want to know about who I'm accountable to, you want to know about what structure I have in my life to keep me from drifting off in a never-never land, what, whatever it is, I'd be more than happy to tell you. I got nothing to hide. Do they submit to the authority of God's word? And in that is their humility you know, humility is not, is not a, if a person is confident in the word of God and in the power of God, they're not lacking humility. A lot of people have a lot of confidence in the word of God, and they are humble because they have submitted to the word of God. Are they submitted to the word of God? Are they authentic? Is a religious leader, do, do they have this pious nature? Do they talk one way in one situation, another way in another situation? Do they express love in a righteous way, in a healthy way, which in a righteous way is sacrificial? Do they have a sacrificial love about them? And that doesn't mean they're always going to have that 24-7, but is their life over time marked by selfless love? And then kind of the last thing that falls under the look piece, what do their followers look like? Birds of a feather, you heard the saying? Flock together. Oh baby, do they flock together. I always see, it's kind of funny to me. It, you know, I say this to my staff all the time. Birds of a feather flock together. 
They just do. If you've got one false teacher, there's gonna be people that grant them influence and they are gonna fall for their bad stuff. Not because necessarily that this person is, is winning them over with their, their great intelligence, it's because they're basically the same. They're kindred spirits and they're scratching each other's itches. Be wary of that. Look around them. Look around them. Now again, I'm not, so we believe in a God that can change the lives of people. We believe in a God that has the power to transform a person from the inside out. So we're always hopeful for that. But you also have to be careful because there are false teachers. And you know, there's, again, I, I, I throw out Dr. Phil-isms every so often. But Dr. Phil says the greatest indicator of future behavior is past behavior. Now, I'm not judging people. I will give a person every chance to not be defined by their past. But at the same time, I'm also aware it's an extremely hard hurdle to overcome. And only Christ can help people overcome it. You know, the number, it's kind of interesting because, you know, you have people that have conflict with everybody in their life. They just, they're, they're always critical. They always have conflict. They just go boom, 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 boom. And they go through life that way. It's, it's not a question of whether or not they're mad at somebody. It's a question of who are you mad at right now? But you know, what's funny is it never occurs to them that the common denominator is them. It never, never. And, and so at some point, you gotta make it about yourself and you gotta understand it's not everybody else. It's you, it's me. And rather than blaming everybody else and just gravitating towards whoever tells me what I wanna hear because I don't wanna have to deal with the really hard stuff about myself, I'm gonna trust the Lord and allow him to break me if that's what he wants to do. I'm gonna allow him to tear me down piece by piece because I know he's gonna rebuild me. And that's faith. I don't wanna be a person that comes before Jesus and he says, get away from me. I never knew you. But just the very thought of that. You know, we talk about working out your faith with fear and trembling. If you can get past that text and not tremble just a little bit, combined with the teaching on false teachers, I don't know what to say. It shakes me right down to my socks. So I gotta have all these things in place because it, it's just such, it's such a big deal and we have to be so cautious about it. So in, under look, the last t the text I wanna take you to, so you look, this, these are the words of Jesus again. He gives us a clue. So, verse 15, st still in Matthew 7, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into a fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Stop and look. Just look. Don't get blinded by it. Maybe they're a family member. Maybe they're somebody that you really, really like. Doesn't mean that you turn on them. But it doesn't mean you grant them influence either. You be cautious. You be cautious. Stop, look, and then the last one is listen. Pay attention to the words. Pay attention to what's not being said. What is not being said. Jesus talks about blind guides, verse 15, or chapter 15. So Matthew 15, uh, we're going to start with verse 1. So here's an here's amazing text from Jesus. Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law, that they now arrive from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, why do your disciples disobey an age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? 
For instance, God says, honor your, your father and your mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give God what I would have given to you. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. They twisted the scripture to suit their needs. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see what Jesus is saying? People talk, they talk but their hearts reveal the truth. It says their worship is a farce and they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. They add things to suit themselves. They they, they kinda have a, um, you know, they kinda have a big uh, thing that they put their hat on, a big issue. Like for example, I I, I hate to use this, but it's the one that I've seen uh, probably the most over the last two years, politics, right? They use man-made ideas as commands from God. If you've ever said that if a person is truly saved, they have to be of a certain political persuasion. If you've ever said that, be careful. Because ideology does not have anything to do with salvation. It's this work of Jesus Christ. And and so you have to be careful with that. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come in here. Listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. That reveals the condition of your heart. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? Jesus replied, every plant not planted by my heavenly father will be uprooted. So ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind, and if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. Sometimes you just let those birds of a feather flock together and let them both go in the ditch together. It's sad when that happens. It really is. It's sad. Now, how do you know if you're a guide that you're not a blind guide? Transparency and accountability and submission to the word of God. That's it. Those are the ones. You know, it's, it it's really is. It's like, you know, I've used this analogy before, but I can remember we did this, uh, when I was in the Coast Guard, we did this thing where we would have, uh, it was a fundraiser, and we had this blind maze. And, and, you know, we'd begin out, I'd have all these people, I'd say, hold on to my shirt, and I'll lead you through the maze. And we'd get into the maze where it's pitch dark and then I would break loose and I'd run off because I knew the maze in the dark and I'd run off to the end and people would just be lost in the maze. You got to hold on to Jesus. You got to hold on to the word of God because if you are lost in the maze, what are you going to do to get found? How do you know? You know, the weird thing about being in a pitch dark maze is you could be touching something, you don't have a clue what it is, right? And maybe depending on your state of mind, maybe you make it something really kind of nasty or maybe, you know, you know, like if you, you ever touched a, a mop, a wet mop in pitch dark, let your imagination run wild, right? What is, what is that? Ah. Jello, jello in the dark. What is that? Ah. Right? But see, this, this is this piece. You got to be careful. Um, and so Jesus himself, blind guides. How would you like to be the blind guide that's, that's leading the other people into the ditch? I, I, I have seen people in ministry that, um, and I, it's, it's very sad when it happens, but they, they, they create this following and then they go off with this following and a few years down the line, they just completely run those people into the ditch. And I've seen it. I've seen it multiple, multiple, multiple times. Because they just impulsively, they get, they get, um, they get brought into something. Um, he goes on, he goes on to say that, um, 
For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He uses three examples. He threw them into hell and gloomy pits and darkness. This word, this gloomy pit, this hell, it's a deeper section of hell. It's it's like the deepest, most darkest part of hell where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. Noah preached and preached and preached and people rejected it. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people in the vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people, but God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of shameful immorality and the wicked people around him. Three examples of how the vast majority of people were misled, but God delivered the faithful few. He delivered the faithful few. It says, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment. Until the day of final judgment. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. Let me repeat that. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desires and who despise authority. Let that sink in. If you're one of the last of the rebels, that's not a good thing. If you're allowing yourself to be influenced by somebody, ask yourself a simple question. Who are they granting authority to? And if you are a person, if you're back there and you're kind of, maybe you're you're gaining some influence with some people and you're having these conversations with people, who are you accountable to? And don't say Jesus. Right? It's this picture. It goes on to say these people are proud and arrogant, daring to even scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. Uh, they just, they, they know, they know, the, they know they have it down pat. But the angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. We're gonna expand on that a little bit more next week. But it's this idea that there's no, there, there's no um, reverence for authority. And, and just so you know, if there's one thing that I have seen markedly shift through my lifetime, it has been the way we treat authority. I mean, we just can't submit to anybody anymore. We can't submit to anything, anybody, anything, except people that are our friends. Then all of a sudden, man, we grant them all kinds of influence, and we don't even have a, a support structure to evaluate whether or not they're telling the truth doesn't matter they're my friends well it matters in the long run and you know we we talked about the last several weeks that second peter is a letter that peter has written to the people that he is leading because he knows he's going to die soon and he is warning them and this is a warning for us it's not a question of whether or not you're going to have to deal with a false teacher it's a question of when and are you ready are you ready to deal with it? Do you have people in your life? Have you stopped? Have, and, and don't be impulsive. Have you looked? Uh, do, you, do, you have a, do you have an evaluation system by which you determine whether or not somebody is telling the truth or according to what, what truth? And listen. What's their ultimate goal? Is their ultimate goal to lead people to Jesus? Or is their ultimate goal to develop a follow, following and stroke their own ego. What's their point? Are they seeking personal gain? Or are they servants of the Most High God? Stop, look, and listen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. And and Lord, I do pray for all of us. I pray for those of us that are people of influence. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be good and that we would be submitted to your authority, to your godly authority that you've put in our lives, that we would be transparent and honest and sincere. 
not trying to hide anything, but putting it all out there. Putting it all out there, not in a bragging sort of a way, but a way of just wanting, wanting people to know not just your truth, but the truth about them. Lord, we pray for godly leaders. Godly leaders that know your truth and are submitted to your authority and the authority and the structure that you've built up in your church. Lord, don't let us be blind guides and don't let us follow blind guides. Let us be a people that are holding on to the true guide, that are holding on to your word and are able to to persevere through faith. Lord, your word makes it very clear. You rescue the, the faithful. Continue to rescue us, Lord. Continue to help us and guide us through this life. Help us to bear true fruit and be those people you've called us to be. Lord, if there's people here today that that for the first time, they're hearing things and it's making sense and there's something inside of them that wants to respond to you, wants to surrender to you. Lord, I lift them up to you. I pray that today would be a day of true salvation for them. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and you would fill them and that you would guide them, Lord. Guide them into all truth. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our, into us. Lord, help us. Help us not be deceived. Help us not be ill-prepared to what the enemy is going to do around us. So, Lord Jesus, as we go into this time of response, we pray that you would bless us, that you would use the communion with power if we want to take communion. Lord, if people want to receive prayer, anoint that prayer and use it to strengthen them and to bless them. Let the rest of us just worship, just truly worship in spirit and truth, because you alone are worthy of our praise. We pray this in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Respond as the Spirit leads you.
for that, right? But we can be a place of genuine, transparent, authentic leaders who love Jesus. And that's what, that's what we strive to be. So I wanna urge you, it's not, you know, obviously fear and trembling as we work through things. You know what? That's all part of it. But if you know Jesus and you have the word of God, Go back to chapter one. You have everything that you need. You have the Holy Spirit and you have the truth. And that'll get you through the maze. Please stand, receive this blessing as we dismiss you here today. I pray that you go now knowing the love of God, the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, 
and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day and a great week.